Hi, Agile India 2020. My name's Karen Ferris and I'm joining you via video from Melbourne, Australia. I'm an organisational change management consultant and a service management consultant as well. What I wanted to share with you um, is why we need a culture of innovation. Every organisation, regardless of size, of industry, has to have a culture for innovation if they're going to stay ahead of the game, um, be ahead of the competition, and not only survive, but actually thrive. So I'm going to explore what innovation is, so they're on the same page, why we need it, and what a culture for innovation actually looks like. So let's start off with what it um, is and why we need it. So innovation means we create something different or we introduce something new that's going to achieve a tangible result. Without innovation, there isn't anything new. Um, and without anything new, there will be no progress. The organisation will not evolve. Innovation is needed for continual evolution. And organisations that don't will not remain relevant. And when you think about it, it's difficult to identify industry where innovation wouldn't be important. Um, we often think of the innovative organisations and the Amazons and the Apples of the world. But even government organisations, if they don't look to innovate and do things better, quicker, cheaper, um, someone else will do it for them. So they have to keep innovating. So organisations need to innovate to stay ahead of the competition. Innovative businesses keep their operations, service and products relevant to the customer needs and changing marketing conditions. They're always looking to what is changing and what do we, how do we need to innovate? What does the customer, the consumer and the constituent demand that we need to do? Innovation really comes down to do or die. So innovation is everyone's business. It cannot be the responsibility of a few people behind a closed door that says innovation office or innovation lab. It has to be everybody's business. So the culture is one in which everyone knows that they can come up with new ideas, they can innovate, they can experiment. It is every employee's job, not the domain of a few PhDs or a few executives. And this belief has to permeate the organisation for innovation to become the way thing we do things around here. So, as I've said, innovation will help companies stay agile, stay relevant and keep evolving. And there should be recognition that not innovating, not doing it is probably the biggest risk to the organisation. So we need to encourage everybody to be curious, challenge the status quo. There should be no, well, we've always done it like that. Um, we need to be open and honest, have those conversations, have constructive conflict, share ideas and explore um, initiatives without fear of people, someone saying, well, that's a stupid idea because there is no such thing. Every idea should be heard and valued. So let's look at what a culture of innovation looks like. So what needs to, to change? If we want employees to really innovate and experiment uh, and try new things, we need a culture, an environment that supports that. So there's a number of things I'm going to explore. Leadership. Now, when I talk about leadership, I'm not talking about somebody who has been bestowed a title. Everyone in the organisation can lead. So we're going to talk about leadership and employee autonomy. I'm also going to talk about psychological safety. We hear that term a lot uh, today. Well, what does that really mean and why do we need it for innovation? 
I'm going to look at celebration and reinforcing the innovative behaviors and also having a growth mindset. There are the things that are the foundation to build that culture for innovation, without which we will be dead in the water. So leadership has to, has to move away from command and control, not just for a culture of innovation, but for a myriad of reasons, if organizations are gonna truly evolve and move forward. Um, and command and control is when managers, I won't call them leaders, managers micromanage. They say, I want you to do this and I want you to do it my way. It's my way or the highway. And micromanagement will kill innovation. No one will put their hand up to suggest a different way of doing things or a new idea. It will be killed. And when managers micromanage, the only thing they are saying to the employees is, I don't trust you. And that will destroy any relationship of mutual respect and trust because they're saying, I don't trust you to do what I want you to do. So leaders have to move away from command and control to delegation and trust. For some leaders, that is a huge leap of faith. So when I work with leaders and leadership teams or managers and management teams, we start in small steps. So what do we need to do to move to um, delegation and trust? Well, we need to set clear objectives and expectations. What is the outcome we're looking for? When do we need it by? What's the available budget if that's appropriate? Um, how often will we check in together to make sure we're progressing? And it's not management by abdication. It's managers saying, I'm not going to micromanage. You do it your way. These are my expectations of you. And you have expectations of me as your manager. And I'm, but I'm always here whenever you need me. If you need me to remove obstacles or step in and do help you, I am here. But if you don't, we'll just check in at the um, frequency that we've agreed. And then the, the manager, the leader has to get out of the way. So we provide employees with the autonomy to do something the way they feel best to do it, knowing that they have support and that the leader has their back. Now, often when I work with management teams, they go, oh my gosh, she's gonna be anarchy. And I go, well, it's not because you provide guardrails. So guardrails are like the, the guardrails we have on a road that are there to keep us all going in the same direction and hopefully stop us going off the road. When we bump up against a guardrail, we know we have to take um, action. So guardrails are like principles or parameters by which people will operate. And when we start to bump up against those parameters of those guardrails, that's when we reach out um, to our leadership, to our managers, um, and discuss what it is that we want to do. So it's a bit like, um, I've heard the, the, the saying, you know, if you're shooting above the water line, you're okay, because we can probably fix that, that hole in the ship. If you're shooting below the water line or you're about to, perhaps, no, don't do it, because that's probably damage that we cannot fix quickly. Um, so provide those principles by which people uh, can operate. There has to be trust. Employees have to trust that their uh, leader will let them get on with the job. They have to trust, uh, and the leader has to trust the employee to do the right thing. And trust um, is, can take a long time to build and a second to lose. And so trust is absolutely important. Transparency is key. And that's being everybody being open and honest. And someone saying, 
you know what we I tried this and it didn't work and that's okay because we've learned something okay, so everybody being transparent and sort of saying I don't know how to do this um and and being yeah open and honest I mentioned start small you know say to um Jack Jack I want you to do this task and the manager is going to have to have an open and honest conversation with Jack to say, I am trying to move away from micromanaging or being hands on and find the words that they're comfortable with away from being hands on and step back and give you more autonomy to do things you want. So Jack has to understand that you are trying to change your approach and the way that you work. And then just pick a small, low risk thing that Jack can go away and do. Um, set those objectives, set clear objectives, set your expectations. This is when we need it by. Um, this is how often we'll check in. Off you go. And because it's low risk, that manager should feel less concerned or less anxious about delegating to Jack. And they will see magic happens. I'm telling you, without exception, I've seen magic happen when leaders or managers make this shift. Start small, do it once, see Jack absolutely sore, engagement increases, Jack is motivated, he's inspired and he's innovating. Um, but be consistent. Don't give up the reins and allow some autonomy. And then when a crisis hits, pull him back in the control. That's again is saying, in good times, I trust you, but not when the going gets tough. So we need to be consistent in action. Psychological safety, um, absolutely imperative for a culture of innovation. Psychological safety is the belief that, that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, uh, or mistakes. And psychological safety, the term was coined by Harvard business professor, Amy Edmondson. And she did extensive research on teams and their effectiveness. And when, when her first uh, round of data showed that better teams, better performing teams were making more mistakes. And Amy Edmondson said, that doesn't seem right. Um, it's a bit odd. So they, her and her team, they dug a bit deep, deeper. And the conclusion was that better teams were not actually making more mistakes. Um, they were communicating them. They were the teams that were talking about them as opposed to being quiet about them. So they were communicating openly. They were open and honest and they said, we made a mistake. Or I've got an idea, a better way of doing this. And they had that environment where they felt safe. And she coined the term psychological safety. There was also a project you may have heard of called Project Aristotle that was carried out at Google because Google wanted to know what made high performing teams. And again, they concluded that one of the uh, top uh, traits of high performing teams was psychological safety. So teams that make more mistakes are more successful because they're comfortable to talk about them they're comfortable to share them and they are comfortable to take risks knowing there's not going to be any reprimand if things go wrong that there is a culture that says yes speak up yes challenge and that's that's good you're safe to do so no one will reprimand you or punish you for doing that. And if we don't have this environment of psychological safety, no one is going to put their hand up and say, I want to try something different. No one is going to challenge the status quo. And I'm telling you now that that silence you get because of the absence of psychological safety is a killer. Because nothing will change. And the people closest to knowing what should change will not tell anyone they'll keep it quiet. There will be no innovation. So we need people who will lead by example. So 
this is where if you're in a position of responsibility and it doesn't mean you've got the title or of a leader and a leader isn't a title it's something you earn through demonstrated behavior um if you lead by example and say yeah i made mistakes i actually made a mistake two weeks ago got it totally wrong but that's okay i learned by it and i moved on and you know lead by example ask for help as a leader you don't know have to know everything that's why you have a team so reach out and say i don't have the answer what do you think so show your fallibility and say you know i need i i may miss something i need to hear from you so create safety for people speaking up make sure they know that what they say is valued there is no stupid idea and that you're open to opinions that could be different from your own and that's a fine let's let's have the debate let's have the conversation and you know be approachable and encourage people to ask questions so we really need to encourage people to ask questions and lead by example show your own fallibility and vulnerability and others will then do the same yeah the other thing is we need to encourage active listening and this is so important because active listening is when you you're not just hearing the noise you're actually listening to what someone is saying to you and when someone knows that you're actively listening they will feel valued and they will feel prepared to share more and more with you so this is about really listening looking someone in the eye even if it's virtually um avoiding any distraction and repeating back to that person what they've said. So I, under, from what you've said, I, I'm hearing this. So that person can say, yeah, that's spot on. That's exactly what I'm saying. Or, well, no, not quite. What I actually meant was this. So we make sure that we're all on the same page. So active listening is absolutely important. Um, as I've said, if individuals don't speak up in meetings, then we need to actively ask them for their ideas. Um, you really encourage people to speak and make sure they know that um, you're listening to them. So leaders need to ask questions and question people. We need to create that safe, safe environment so that everyone knows that all ideas are accepted. There is no judgment. It could be a wacky idea, but that's all right because some of those most crazy ideas, as people go, well, that's a bit crazy, but if we did this and we added this and we did this, we've really got something that's innovative and could actually fly. So we need to ha never have any blame placed. Um, those wacky ideas are encouraged and will be listened to. And we have an environment that has curiosity we ask lots of questions and we keep asking why and we need to have an open mindset we all unfortunately have biases we have filters and they're on but they're based on our life experience um uh, you know what we've learned along the way that we need to try and remove those filters and biases so we have an open mind to new ideas, uh, innovative ideas. So we need to make sure or encourage people to share ideas with each other without judgment um, and let people have those conversations about the ideas. Um, there is no criticism. We encourage people uh, to see feedback as a way to strengthen your ideas and come up with bigger and, and better innovative uh, products or services. Celebrate. Celebrate is an easy word to say and often we forget to do it in our busy, busy business lives. Um, but we need to celebrate people that take risks. We need to celebrate successes. And we all need, also need to celebrate the setbacks. I hate using the word failure, but celebrate the setbacks. Um, because without celebration, innovation is going to be crushed. Yeah. So 
we celebrate the setbacks because they are opportunities to have learned from the setback. With every setback, you're a step nearer to success. And setbacks is, all, is what innovation and experimentation is all about. We're going, what if we did this? No, that doesn't work. What if we did this? Mm, not quite. What if we did this? Yes. So we need to celebrate setbacks. And if we don't do that, um, we won't get innovation. And it's like, you know, Thomas Edison is, is often quoted as saying, um, he's the guy that invented the light bulb. Um, I haven't failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that don't work. So um, it is fitting to celebrate the failures or the setbacks that are related to innovation. So how do we do that? Well, firstly, don't forget to celebrate. Um, and as I said, celebrate the setbacks as learning opportunities. Hey, gay, guys, that didn't work. But, you know, that's we ticked that off the list. We're a step nearer being successful. And we need to change the language. As I've said, I don't particularly like the term failure. Um, I'd rather say a setback because it sounds more failure. So it sort of sounds like a permanent or a setback is temporary. It's a setback. We can now move forward. And I often talk about um, in the work I do around resilience, about when we have a setback, we don't just bounce back. We bounce forward, having learned from it. So we need to change the language. Um, there is no shame about setbacks, There's no shame about mistakes. It's OK to be vulnerable um, and let people talk about it. And that means we encourage that sort of language because we can then all share and learn from something. Um, you know, find the, the, the germ of a great idea that could be there. One thing um, I've often done is create a fail wall. It could be virtual on a collaboration platform or physical where people can put up, you know, post-it notes or sticky notes or something on a virtual um, wall that says, I had a setback, this is what I learned. So that it, it, it removes that stigma of setbacks being a bad thing. Um, so we celebrate. Yeah, I had a setback. And it, and it emphasizes that everybody can have setbacks. And we're honoring these people that thought outside the box or had innovative ideas. As well as that, you can create a kudos wall where when someone's had a real a win um, that you, you know, you celebrate that. Um, again, sticky notes, virtual or physical, that says well done to so-and-so for whatever it was, having an innovative idea and sharing that with the team. Um, so kudos wall and fail wall and celebrate the heroes. Um, the award, reward and recognize the heroes, those people who have had innovative ideas um, who took um, ambition, amb ambitious risks, even if they, you know, went down in flames, they had that setback. But when you reward that, it encourages um, or it changes the idea that the shame or humiliation associated with something not going as, as, as we thought it would. Um, so rather than letting the setbacks becoming part of people's identity, you know, they're branded as the risk takers, the heroes. And the final one around celebration is, you know, actively kill ideas. Um, and I've seen this in a couple of organizations where when an idea is like, no, it's just not gonna fly. Everyone agrees, it's a consensus. This is not gonna fly. We're flogging the dead horse, whatever phrase you want to use. And we, we they hold funerals. Um, to bury the idea that did not work and say, OK, as a team, we're putting this one um, away. Uh, so, you know, do it that everyone is visual to everyone. And it's OK to have ideas that didn't get off the ground for whatever reason. Um, so, yes, yeah, celebrate that, too. And then let's everybody focus on focus on priorities.
The other thing we need to make sure we do is use positive reinforcement. And this is how we motivate our teams and we motivate each other and get more and more innovation. And positive reinforcement is about recognizing the behaviors you want to see more of. So when someone does take an, a risk or experiments or comes up with an innovative idea, we, posit, we reward and we recognize that, which is positive reinforcement. So you focus less on what people are doing wrong and more on what they're doing right. So reward and praise people every time they experiment, challenge the status quo. And if you do that, reward and recognize and positively reinforce, you're conditioning people to do more of the same, more of the behaviors that you want to see. And there's a few things about positive reinforcement um, that are very important. So it can be a simple pat on the back. You know, positive reinforcement sounds like a grand, grandiose statement or title, but it really could just be well done. And it could be a virtual pack or pat on the back. You know, it could be a thank you note. Um, and I'll tell you now that handwritten notes are so powerful because it shows people have really taken some consideration and time. So even if you handwrite a note and then scan it and send it, as opposed to sending an email, which can feel very sterile, um, a thank you note is, is very, very powerful. Um, the other thing about positive reinforcement, and there's a few things here that I'd like to mention. One is be specific. On the previous slide, we saw it's a good job. That is not how we positively reinforce. We need to be absolutely specific about what it is we're reinforcing. What was the behavior that we want to see more of? So rather than say good job or, you know, you're a hard worker, um, it's really saying thank you for doing a great job on that assignment and getting it in on time uh, to me yesterday. Um, so be very specific about the behavior you want to see more of. The other thing you need to do as well is do it in a timely manner, as close to the time the behavior was exhibited. Because if you say to me six months down the line, oh, thanks for getting that assignment back in time, I'm gonna say, what assignment was that? Um, I really don't know what behavior I was exhibiting that you'd like to see more of. So it has to be timely. So that means that, you know, we need to be in the fray and be able to say, that's the, the behavior I'm going to reward and I'm going to do it now. So it's very clear what you're rewarding and it's timely. So we can have recognition programs that organizationally wide reinforce the behaviors, encourage more innovation, more challenging the status quo and encourage you know peer-to-peer -peer recognition it doesn't have to be a manager to a, a team member peers can recognize each other as well and again following the same you know timely manner and being specific so get everybody trying this i've mentioned the kudos wall where people can can reach out and and, and recognize people for what they've done so make sure um, it is clear what you're thanking people for. And also be authentic, be sincere. Don't just go, oh, we've got to thank someone for doing something and I'm going to go through the motions. People will know if you're not sincere and you're not authentic. So really mean it if you're going to do it. If you're not, don't. The other thing we need to foster is a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset. So over 30 years ago, a uh, professor a lady called Carol Dweck, and if you haven't read her, her stuff or watched her TED Talks, please, um, please do, um, and Carol Dweck. And he, she and her colleagues became interested in student attitudes towards 
what they called failure, setback. And they noticed that some students bounced forward um, from setbacks, while other students were oh, devastated by even the smallest thing. And she studied behavior of thousands of children and coined as a result of that study, the terms fixed mindset and growth mindset. And it's about underlying beliefs people have about their learning and intelligence. So the students that you know believed that they could get smarter, they understood that their efforts made them stronger, put in extra time and effort, and they knew that that would lead to higher achievement. They had the growth mindset. And the growth mindset gives us a hunger for learning and development. We're curious and we're ready to innovate. A fixed mindset is one where we're saying, no, nah, this is who I am. I can't learn anymore. I can't develop anymore. I can't grow anymore. It's fixed. Um, there is no innovation. So having a growth mindset can be learned. And if you can imagine an entire organization that embraces uh, a growth mindset is a constantly learning organization. Um, people will feel more empowered and committed. They'll have a shared sense of purpose and there'll be organizational wide support for um, innovation. So this is an infographic um, or an illustration, if you like, that's out the, that is from Carol Dweck um, that you can yeah, Google and you'll find this image. And I think it's quite a powerful one. Um, we have fixed mindset on the left hand side, which says intelligence is static, where on the right hand side, the growth mindsets is intelligence can be developed. So the fixed mindset will avoid challenges, uh, give up easily, see effort as fruitless. What's the point? Um, ignore feedback um, and not see that as a growth opportunity and feel threatened by the success of other people. Where if we have a growth mindset, we embrace challenges. So bring it on, bring it on. We persist through setbacks. We keep bouncing forward and we see effort as necessary to master something. We know if we want to learn to play the piano, it's gonna take effort and practice and we recognize that and we're up for it. And we learn from feedback and what people tell us. We're open to listen to what people are saying to us. And we um, find you know, lessons and inspiration in the success of others. We look at other people who are successful. We look up to them and say, what can I learn from that person? So it is a really powerful um, approach to innovation. So listen to your fixed mindset. The brain, as you probably know, is like a muscle. And if you exercise, it gets denser. So the more you use it. So here, if you have a fixed mindset, once you know and you can hear it, then you can do something about it. You can anticipate it. So just listen for it. It's the, I can't do that. It won't work. Tried that before. Um, and then recognize you have a choice. Mindsets are just beliefs. And you can change your mind. You can change your beliefs. So you ha do have a choice. And then talk back to it, you know, with a growth mindset. Challenge it. Why am I saying that to myself? And, you know, take the growth mindset action. That's taking little steps. We don't go out. We don't have an objective to run a marathon and go out tomorrow and do it for the first time. We do it in small steps when we practice and then we practice a bit more and we go a bit further. So and the finally um, embrace the power of not yet. This is so powerful. And this was based on, again, Carol Dweck um, found a, a high school in Chicago with an unorthodox grading system. Students had to pass a certain number of classes to graduate. And if they don't pass, they get a different kind of grade. And the grade is, is not yet. So they can pass as a grade or they get the grade of not yet. Um, you know, if you get a fail grade, you think I'm going nowhere, I can't do it. But if you get the, the grade of not yet, you understand you're on a learning curve. I had a go, 
haven't got there yet and not yet is so powerful i absolutely love that and not yet gives you that um what do you call it um, pathway to the future you know it's a journey it's a learning journey you're on and you you recognize that So our culture for innovation, so, so, so important. Um, if organizations will remain relevant and thrive um, in a world that's constantly changing, if we don't keep up or and even get ahead of the changes that are happening through innovation and evolution, we will just uh, be dead in the water. So innovation has to be everyone's business. We need to create that culture where people know they can challenge the status quo, they can have a good idea, and it will be heard and valued and discussed and explored. We have to have management that moves from command and control, where no one has any freedom and no autonomy, to leaders that lead through delegation and trust set expectations and then get out of the way. We need an environment of psychological safety where no one is, has any fear of challenging, speaking up, questioning, presenting new ideas. And without that, you will just have silence. People will be afraid to contribute. They need to feel safe. They need to feel that there is no such thing as a stupid idea. When we have celebrate, when we have setbacks, we celebrate them. When we have successes, we celebrate. And there's lots of ways that we can do that. And it doesn't have to cost anything. But the power of celebrating setbacks as well as failures is, is immense. Positive reinforcement. When we see the behaviours we want to see more of, whether this is a leader with the team or peer to peer, reinforce that. You just innovated and you came up with a new idea that led to blah. Be specific and be timely, but reinforce the behaviours you want to see more on. Focus on the good things, not the bad. And then finally, we talked about um, growth mindset, moving from the fixed mindset where I can't learn, develop it is what it is, to the growth mindset that says I can, I can, and I'll practice and I'll move forward in small steps and we'll get there. I appreciate your time. Um, at Agile India 2020 to listen to how to create a culture of innovation. There's some contact details there. If you'd like to reach out to me post the conference at any time, karenferris.com is the website and there's lots of material and blogs and posts and videos um, about leadership, resilience, change. And that's one of my publications that came out last year, 2019, um, Game On, Change is Constant, how we need to keep uh, winning when leading changes everyone's business, just like innovation is. So thank you so much for listening.